Welcome to Teaching Artist Podcast, a show dedicated to discussions of teaching art to kids, making art, and how those things overlap and feed each other. I'm Rebecca Potzagire, your host, an artist and educator. Welcome to season three. Ah, oh, it's hard to believe this is really the start of my third year producing this show, but here we are. I want to start with a thank you. Really, I started this show with really no clue what I was getting myself into and no idea whether anyone else would want to hear these conversations. It has been wonderful getting to know so many artists, share their stories, and connect with this community. I'm excited about this new season. Hi, it's been a while. Thank you for sticking with me and allowing me a bit of a break from podcasting. I actually took some time to not work on any of my very many projects, to just hang out with my husband and daughter, play games, make puzzles, and relax. I was really feeling the burnout, as I'm sure many of you have felt, but that time really helped. I hope you also got some time to relax and listen to your body and let your mind rest. I know it's hard right now, as so many schools are either going back to virtual learning and all the challenges there as COVID surges again, or pushing forward and putting educators in potentially scary situations. I feel like there's not much I can do, but just know that you're not alone. You can reach out on Instagram or email and connect, or join us at our next Teaching Artists Lounge community meeting. And the next one will feature mini artist talks and will be free. It will be on Saturday, January 29th at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern. To register, go to teachingartistlounge.eventbrite.com. And we should have that set up soon. If the event is not there, you can follow us to get updates. If you're interested in presenting a brief artist talk, you can also sign up through a Google form, and I will leave the link in the show notes. You can also find those links on my Instagram in the link tree, and that's just at Teaching Artist Podcast. The Teaching Artist Lounge is a safe and supportive community for artists who teach. In partnership with Victoria J. Fry of Visionary Art Collective, we get together every month to focus on a topic related to art and or education, and frequently bring in guest speakers to share their knowledge with us. The goal is to bring together teaching artists to share challenges, successes, and resources so that we can feel less alone on these islands of the studio and classroom. Support and inspire each other and learn skills and ideas to improve our practices. We would love to see you there. Today, I have a special episode with Melissa Park, the founder of Black Teaching Artists Lab. Melissa Park shared her journey in bringing an idea to life through Black Teaching Artists Lab, where she conducts research, offers workshops and professional development, and so much more. She shared so vulnerably about mental health and struggles with feeling confident despite being certain of the importance and value of her work. She has created the Afrocentric Social Emotional Learning Framework, which centers social emotional learning, SEL, for the black learner through arts education. There's an immediate need in the US to facilitate equitable learning experiences for the black learner in particular, as they have long since been left out of Eurocentric curriculums and colonized ideologies of success. Melissa talked about developing this framework and using it within professional development for black teaching artists. Another major part of her work is the Pan-African Cultural Exchange, which provides opportunities for Black identifying teaching artists to travel to different parts of the African diaspora in order to better understand the Black experience globally. 
To support this project, you can donate, and I will leave the link in the show notes. Melissa also talked about research and how she began this work. When she asked for data on Black teaching artists and was told it doesn't exist, she decided to gather it herself. She's conducting this research and currently has a survey gathering information from Black identifying teaching artists. If that's you, please respond to her survey. Again, I will leave that in the link in the show notes. It's anonymous and it gathers valuable data to demonstrate the impact of Black teaching artists' work and to tell the stories of their work in different communities. You can also help by sharing the survey widely and getting the word out about this work. Black Teaching Artists Lab is a professional development and travel abroad organization that aims to connect Black teaching artists and learners from the African diaspora through arts education in order to unify and strengthen intercultural understanding between marginalized Pan-African populations. They believe that through the use of art, one of the most powerful tools we have for human expression, Pan-African teaching artists will be able to share their individual stories of the lived Black experience with youth, and especially Black youth, everywhere. Melissa Park is a Brooklyn-based creative that is making waves in the arts education world. Park initially developed her concept for Black Teaching Artists Lab at the beginning of 2019 while working as a community manager at Brooklyn Creative League, a co-working space in Brooklyn, New York. Surrounded by successful entrepreneurs and immersed in the social changes that were underway in America, Park was inspired to turn her big ideas into a tangible new reality. Let's hear from Melissa. So I am talking with Melissa Park today, and I'm so excited to hear your story and to hear about all the amazing work that you're doing. I like to just start with the journey, what brought you to where you are now could you kind of walk us through your story? Thank you. Hi. Yes. Yes. It's such an interesting journey to even think about where I came from, you know, a year ago, much less even five years ago. But I guess I could start with losing my job, losing my job. Like a mm -hmm. lot of folks in 2020 mm -hmm. in March when COVID hit, I was working yeah. at Brooklyn Creative League as a community manager. It was my first office job, but it was the best office job because it was a co-working space. And I got to meet people who, you know, were architects, who were nonprofits, who were, you know, social entrepreneurs. And I wanted to be that. And I was the person mm -hmm. that was a glue. They saw me. They were happy to see me. I was doing their mail, but I lost my job and I needed to figure out what I wanted to do. And during that time, there was a lot of conversation about George Floyd, a lot of conversation about racial equity. And I decided to start Black Teaching Artist Lab because I needed a job and there was a need and it was exciting mm -hmm. and it still is really exciting, but not having a necessarily an arts background and having more of an administrative and educational background was a little bit difficult. Uh, I am a creative person. I do play bass and I communicate with a lot of artists. A lot of my friends are artists, but I definitely do not consider myself an artist by trade. So getting into that field was very hard, but easy at the same time because I realized that the community was really beautiful and embraceive and wanted to see innovation and I was this wide-eyed bushy-tailed kid and like I want to be a part of this community I want to learn as much of, about teaching artistry and that's kind of my journey it's it's a non-conventional mm -hmm. space because I'm not an artist but I think that's kind of what we need now when you're talking about education. We need someone who understands the the needs of artists but also could have be once removed a little bit uh, to see sort of the bigger picture. And having that admin and education background, I feel like is really valuable there. A lot of teaching artists, like people that come in as artists first, and then they're teaching don't have much of that background, myself included. Like I grew up with teachers, but I didn't go to school for education. Yes, I, I went to school for secondary education and history. Mm-hmm. 
which I, I see a lot of parallels with history and culture and art. So mm-hmm. still being as space isn't so far fetched, but yeah, people ask me all the time, like, what's your art medium? What's your art b- practice? And I, when I, you know, in a bind, I say education and teaching, teaching is sort of like an art form. It's, you know, mm-hmm. you're kind of like on a stage and you have to engage with your students and have to connect with other folks. And it takes interpersonal skills in order for you to do that. So Teaching should definitely be on that list of being an art practice, but looking at it from an educational point of view first is unique and important. Yeah, absolutely. I love the idea of teaching as an art form. I feel like you're so spot on and it's, you know, it's so different talking with students versus when I have to go talk with adults and present to adults, there's like a different level of connection. And it is there's some sort of performative aspect to it, right? There is. But also, you know, I work mostly with teaching artists and not so so much with students. Mm -hmm. It's the same process, you still have to engage with, (laughs) you know, your teaching artists and make sure that they're interested in the work that you're doing. We're all learners at the end of the day. We're just I think of adults as just older versions of kids are all just big kids <laughs> walking around. That's how I view myself. So I always have to figure out ways to engage with folks. And it always makes, it's always fun. Like, again, for me, mm-hmm. education, obviously you, you want to learn, but at the same time, you want to have fun and be in a space where, you know, you're having fun and feel like you're belonged and you're in a brave space to be yourself. And mm-hmm. I think arts education I think we agree with this, offers his hand to that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And could you talk about what Black Teaching Artists Lab is doing? Like, what are your sort of programs? What projects are you working on? We are doing yeah. so many great things. <laughs> so many things. I love it. But for folks who don't know who we are, Black Teaching Artists Lab is an LLC that equips Black teaching artists and all artists with resources and tools to better understand their Black identity or the Black identity of their students. As mm-hmm. we know, 86% of arts educators are white women. You see a large mm-hmm. exodus of... Uh, <laughs> yes, lots. I'm raising um, my hand. <laughs> wonderful arts educators. But we also see there's a lot of exodus of you know Black educators leaving this field a lot of educators are leaving after five years, but we know that having a Black mm-hmm. educator is beneficial for all learners and making sure they go to college, seeing a role model. So what are some tools, what are some ways in which we could support Black educators? So we have the mm-hmm. SCC model at Black Teaching Artists Lab, which is self, culture, and community. The first pillar, we call it our pillars, is self. So we teach Black teaching artists the Afrocentric social emotional learning framework, which is something mm-hmm. I trademarked and I'm currently doing research in. And what it is, is centering the Black learner in their social and emotional learning and understanding using art practices. Mm-hmm. So we train them in this framework. And then once they're trained, the idea is to go into culture, understanding that we're a part of this bigger diasporic community. And we have this program called Pan-African Cultural Exchange that takes these teaching artists mm-hmm. to different parts of the diaspora. So what does it mean to be Black in Puerto mm-hmm. Rico? What does it mean to be Black in Hawaii or uh, Brazil? And do professional development, professional training, doing art collaborations mm-hmm. with artists there. And the goal is to have a better understanding of your Black identity, but also creating curriculum and lesson plans in order for you to move into community, going back into the place where you've taught or the place that you are an artist and become better and I don't want to say better because teaching artists already do this but have a uh, a larger understanding of your black identity through this experience and being culturally responsive learners and explorers of the world so we're hoping that by going through this experience this sort of fellowship that it would provide teaching artists with the tools that they need, as well as providing them with opportunities, as well as making sure that 
they feel like they're leaders in this educational sector and not feeling like they're, you know, have to have a seat at the table and they're having being diversity and all of that. That's that's not the goal. The goal is really being a leader in your own right and mm-hmm. using your art practices to do that, being your own individual and seeing that through education is really key. So that's what we do mm-hmm. in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. And I love that idea of then bringing it back to the students, that it starts with the teacher, that it starts sort of this like personal journey that the teaching artist is on. And then that journey includes a physical journey to these different places and connecting with those cultures, those communities, seeing the variety of what the Black diaspora is, like that it's not monolithic, right? And then kind of bringing that back to the students. I think that's really beautiful, really important too. It's exciting. So thank you for this work. It is a lot of work. I'm very excited. Mm -hmm. And also learning so much about myself and learning about how much I could actually do on my own. I never thought I would be doing Mm -hmm. research, but I'm doing research because there's never, there is no information or quantifiable data on Black teaching artists. I went to my Mm -hmm. partners and I was like, I need some information on Black teaching artists for my business plan. And they said there wasn't. And I was like, we need to have this information in order for us to do the work that Mm -hmm. we want to do, in order for us to have this conversation about diversity and inclusion. If we don't know who we're serving, then how can we better serve them, right? So that question, mm-hmm. you know, the, the work I, everything that I do professionally is for Black teaching artists. So it's important for me to step back and not go into doing, you know, Pan-African Cultural Exchange right now. That's That was ultimately my goal. But to create a foundation in order for people outside of Black teaching artists lab, like, I'm not going to be here forever, but there's going to be black people who want to travel and do this work so we have to have a a good foundation and taking time to do research and finding quantifiable data so i you know i know for a fact that we have 100 teaching artists who say that they need this work they need a framework they need to go to africa for a birthright or they need more support in these areas it only makes us stronger Mm -hmm. but it is a lot of work It, it is undeniably difficult all worth it all worth it though well I love that you you know asked for this information and were told it doesn't exist and instead of being like oh bummer okay what else could I do you were like well it should exist let's make that happen (laughs) just taking that initiative is incredible and I guess the question wrapped up in there is how did you like did you have sort of a research background as well or did you enlist the help of of people who kind of like knew how to do this? It's basically like sociology research, right? Yes, yeah, a little bit of like demographic research, ethnographic, <laughs> cultural anthropology, yeah. history, all right. of that wrapped up into one art. But I mm-hmm. I studied history. I did my thesis on like FDR's international policies during World War II. So I've done research before. Mm-hmm. But I have to give a shout out to Creative Generation who took me on and like they were, they're still my mentors and Andre and Jeff are amazing. Mm -hmm. And they really supported this work. They, you know, it's, we're collaborating right now and I came with them with this idea and, and then all, we're all of a sudden doing this research uh, initiative and, it's really the support of the community. I I can't really mm. give myself too much credit, but every time I came up, should, oh, okay, maybe a little bit, <laughs> but <laughs> you know, the, the arts education community really embraced me. You know, I, I also give credit to the teaching artist project. You know, I really wanted mm. to do a workshop on black teaching artists and didn't really know where to go. So I called up Katie from teaching artists project. She was executive director and I was like, Hey, I really want to do this workshop. Like, do you think I could do it? And she's like, sure. And my mind was blown that someone was interested in the work that I'm doing. So Mm -hmm. last year we did the pilot. They helped tremendously. And then I ended up, they have this 
like eight week intensive, I think it was 12 weeks intensive training for teaching artists I and mean, learning arts and administration, curriculum, and being in, in community with teaching artists. So I did that training, got a scholarship to do that. So it's just, it's it's really the community that, that brought Black Teaching Artists Lab into existence as well as, you know, Creative Generation is part of the community as well. So I've been very, very, very fortunate. And I say this too, because I got my bachelor's in history. I didn't go to get my master's. A lot of these teaching artists may not have gotten their master's, may not even gotten their bachelor's degree. And it's really cool to hopefully have these teaching artists see themselves in me because I had this idea, I had this dream, didn't know anyone in the arts field, and I was able to start an LLC and I'm a part of a fellowship now with Commuta Does America to help with my venture. So there's, if there's a will, there's definitely a way. And mm -hmm. I think just personally, it's definitely hard to think like that. But I am a living proof that if you do work hard enough, things are going to go in the right direction. And I'm in the thick of it, definitely not on the other side, but it's really exciting to I, I hope that teaching artists could connect to that story. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to hear, I guess I have two questions. Maybe we'll follow up with how people can get involved. But first I want to hear more about like what have been the biggest sort of challenges and how have you overcome them or how are you like you're in it? How are you kind of pushing through all of that? That's thank you for asking that. <laughs> um, it's been yeah. <laughs> it's been really difficult. I suffer from a lot of mental illness. I have bipolar mm -hmm. and I don't suffer from depression, but I've been really depressed and I have a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard, as I said before. I it's only really me. I have again support from the community, but you know, I did the survey and like it's my own framework so it's my own idea and then when people ask about mm. you know having me come and do a conference it's like it's exciting but it's also you know, it feels like I'm in sort of a fog mm. so it's it's hard doing this work and it's hard doing this work that you're sort of leading and and having had others do before I, I don't know anyone who's done a, a survey on this or have done this framework and a lot of people don't talk about that. You you hear about founder stories mm -hmm. in the beginning where or when they're at the end or they're super successful. It's like when I was, you know, just starting out, like I only had twenty dollars in my bank account. No one really likes to talk about when they're actually in that headspace. You know, I'm unemployed, mm -hmm. trying to find a job, still haven't, and it's mm -hmm. really hard. It's really difficult every day. And I would be lying to say if I was completely happy, I'm not. But I know the work that I'm doing is making a difference. And that's the mm -hmm. driving force. And every day, I'm very fortunate to have someone motivate me and, and say something really nice and kind about the work that I'm doing. So those, the teaching artists, the Black teaching artists especially, are the ones who keep me motivated and I think that's you know mm -hmm. the the spotlight on you the pressure on you is is definitely the hardest part I try not to post too many pictures of myself on Instagram I always post that one photo <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying I'm trying I'm really trying to grow into my own but you know it's also like mixing business and your personal life that's also kind of hard too mm -hmm. so I guess just being really insecure. I <laughs> think that's just like a summary. And that's real. That's 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 just the, the real of it. Yeah, it's so real. Thank you for sharing all of that. You know, I feel like there's still it's maybe getting better, but there's still such a stigma about talking about mental illness and mental health and you know, just kind of opening up there. And then even like you were saying, talking about this imposter syndrome that we I feel that so much I'm like who am I to be in here talking about this stuff constantly feeling that yeah and then 
especially when you are, like you said, putting your own ideas out there and getting well-deserved recognition for it. But then you have that like voice in the back of your head that's like, no, 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 you know. Every day. Uh, It's wild. Like, do people really want mm. me on their stage in Florida? Like, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it's gonna be fun though. I've never been to Florida before, so it's it's gonna be a that's amazing cool experience. When is the conference? It's in February, and the coolest part is like my mentor that's doing that's helping me with the research. He's on the panel, so it's really mm. cool. He, I don't think he knows that I'm gonna actually got invited to it yet. So it's it's going to be really cool to be on the same stage and actually meet him in person. That's also a, a, a new thing nowadays is, is, is having those yeah. connections with folks after a year and and seeing them in person. It's going to be fun. I'm excited for that. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And then if people want to go, if folks want to go to this conference, can you give us the info? Oh my gosh. And I can also share Let's- it. I actually <laughs> I got invited like two days ago. So okay. let's I'm gonna email you. Slow down. On yeah, that. so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but there's additional information. We are fundraising for a Pan African mm-hmm. Cultural Exchange with IOB, which is a fantastic. I tell this to everyone who is crowdfunding, please consider mm-hmm. IOB. They're amazing crowdfunding platform. And what we're mm-hmm. fundraising for is to launch our Pan-African Cultural Exchange. So we're trying to raise money for grant writing, do a pre-trip. Mm-hmm. So going for a week and talk to our partners in Puerto Rico, do some marketing. So we're trying to raise $5,000. Right now we have close to 1000 We're hoping before mm-hmm. February that we get to our goals. So if anyone's able to donate, you'll get a big air email hug for me <laughs> um, and you'll be it'll be going towards something that I think will help revolutionize education and especially for black educators in professional development so if you're able to do that please donate if you can't share it with folks on your social media that's my quick plug yes yes and I'll share the links check the show notes if you're listening I'll also share on social media and just yeah, absolutely important thing to be supporting. Thank so, you. Yes. Second that plug. Yay. <laughs> yes. And then I wanted to also come back around to how folks can get involved with your research. I know, you know, a big part of it is a survey, like you're asking for information. So who are you looking for? How can um, people that don't fit that sort of profile, how can how can we help? Awesome. Thank you. Again, these are amazing questions. <laughs> it's why you're the host. <laughs> I So right now we're doing our pre-report survey and we're asking teaching artists who identify as Black. So that could be mm-hmm. your African-American. I identify as Afro-Caribbean American. Uh, Afro Latinx or uh, Black identifying Latino. We have so many categories, but folks who right. identify as Black, to fill out this survey, we're really collecting demographic data. Who are you? What what city or state are you from? What's your gender identity? So we could just have that information. And it, it's anonymous, so none of the information is shared out, your personal information. It's only going to be shared mm-hmm. out with our partners. And for folks who are not identifying as Black, please share with folks who you know that are Black that would be interested in this study. What we're also doing, and this is actually the first time I am announcing this, so this is great. We are, mostly me, I'm a part of a storytelling group called Out of Eden, Chicago, and Mm. it is a storytelling group that is a part of the National Geographic Society. And what we do are collect Ooh. stories from within our community is, and we put it on a map so other folks can see how other people live across the world, which is really awesome. What mm. I'm doing is collecting stories from folks from the Pan-African diaspora. So if anyone is from the Pan-African diaspora who lives in New York or anywhere in the, in the diaspora right now, because I'm in New York, and I live in Brooklyn, I'm getting stories from them. But if anyone wants to share their story, we're collecting stories. We're not entirely sure where it's going to land. It's Right now, it's going to be on our website. 
but I have a feeling that this could turn into a really cool art project. So if anyone wants to brainstorm and share their story with Black Teaching Artist Lab's blog, uh, please let me know. Mm. I think it's a really cool idea. I have, I have, you know, some ideas of where to land it, but it's a creative mm. process. But I know, like, I, you know, when you have to do something or you should do something, you just do it, and then things just sort of marinate, and it turns into a really good steak or uh, tofu steak if you don't eat meat. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, I love that, that need to act and then kind of figure out the meaning and like what it's all going to end up as later. I feel like artists will definitely relate to that. You know, for me, it's like, I just need to start playing with some color and see what happens. Yes. And that's, I think it <laughs> yeah. goes back to the original question, which is not even a question you asked, but my my thought on the question you asked about, mm -hmm. you know, being an artist, like that's just sort of how I view any sort of organizational task or need is just looking at things creatively and like just having it in a very abstract way. And I don't know, it's exciting. I'm a, I'm a creative researcher. If one could describe me as anything, I think that would be that. Mm, I love that. Yeah. This combination of demographic, ethnographic, you know, socio-cultural research alongside storytelling. And, you know, like I started while you were talking about the storytelling project, making connections to like sound art projects and performance, but, you know, that it's sort of this record, this connection to history and personal history ancestral history, all of these connections from the past to the present, I think are going to be really beautiful in that project. I'm excited. You're saying that. I'm like, whoa, like that sounds really awesome. It's like, wait, I'm doing that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Super exciting. <laughs> I'm, and excited to share it with mm -hmm. the world. Yeah. And then your website where like if people want to find that when it's, is it not, it's probably not available yet. Yeah, it will um, be on uh, www.blackteachingartistlab.com. Uh, we're in cool. January, we will be launching our resources section with all of the mm -hmm. resources. I'm currently in the midst of recording content for Afrocentric SEL framework. So folks mm -hmm. could get a taste of what we do, as well as having mm -hmm. the the ethnographic research, which is called Zora's Legacy after the great Zora Neale Hurston, mm -hmm. the cultural anthropologist, which I honestly, to be mm -hmm. to be truthful, I, I didn't actually know who she was until somebody told me that I'm doing similar work than she. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I did my research and realized that I'm doing what she's done. Continuing, continuing the legacy. Continuing the legacy. I hope to make her proud. Mm -hmm. And I think I think I'm I'm on my way. Absolutely. Huge thank you to Angela Hodinger, who just signed up as a supporter through Patreon. I am so, so grateful for your support. Sharing the podcast with fellow teaching artists, leaving a review, or sending me feedback are also wonderful ways to support the show for free. You can reach me at teachingartistpodcast at gmail.com or DM me on Instagram at teachingartistpodcast. There are also a few ways to support financially, which really helps me keep this going. I've been hiring an editor to help me lately. If you love the podcast and are able to chip in to keep it going, you can head to anchor.fm slash teachingartistpodcast slash support or just click the link in the show notes. There, you can contribute one, five, or ten dollars per month, and I would so, so appreciate your support. I'm wondering too if you could talk more about your framework. Just looking through, it looks like it's connected to the castle framework. Very um, much borrowed. 
<laughs> yeah. borrowed a lot from there. <laughs> Which I realize maybe we should say for people who don't know what Castle is, that that is a social emotional learning framework that a lot of schools and teachers are using. I know in my schools, the schools I was teaching at used Ruler, which is connected mm-hmm. to Castle. So it's sort of like a base, a framework that a lot of schools and teachers use, even if you maybe don't know you are right. using it. Yeah. <laughs> There's five competencies, but yes, I'll let you well, go into I, it. <laughs> a lot of, I know Castle, they, they came out with equity and transformative social emotional learning, which is where we got a lot of our content from. But the mm-hmm. the I guess the ethos of SEL is to work on our soft skills and understanding that we live mm-hmm. in a world that's very diverse and that people come from different backgrounds mm-hmm. and that we have to have a better understanding of how do we communicate with one another. So mm-hmm. that sort of ethos, and that's the ethos that I want and I, I see for Black educators and Black teachers and students, unfortunately, and I and I looked this up and I was doing, as I was doing my research, I realized that, you know, a lot, there was a lot of writing about how SEL framework does not work for Black and Brown kids. And then transformative mm-hmm. SEL came out to combat not only Black and Brown kids, but any marginalized group. And I was like, this is so whack. Like, this does not work for me. And I also was doing mm-hmm. research on the racial identity development, which came out by someone, William Cross. And that was someone who was white. And I was like, okay, mm-hmm. this, it's, it's really good. Like I, I could resonate with this experience. I also want to say because you're white doesn't mean you don't like necessarily, you'll never understand the black experience, but the way mm-hmm. in which he structured it resonated with me as someone who was of color. But I was like, we need something that's by us for us. So I took those two concepts that sort mm-hmm. of worked and created Afrocentric SEL framework, but also had the Mm -hmm. component of arts education. So for example, so we had the five competencies, Afrocentric self-awareness, self-care, relationship skills, social awareness, and responsible decision-making. So an example of Mm -hmm. Afrocentric social awareness, which is my favorite competency, is understanding that Mm -hmm. Blackness is not a monolith, as you said before, and that we come from different parts mm-hmm. of the diaspora and that we're connected through our West African heritage. And I, when we do our, our workshop, I always do it with a teaching artist. So I talk about the theoretical part, like, you know, this is blah, 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 blah. And then mm-hmm. teaching artist really talks about what does Afrocentric social awareness looks like in practice. So one example is dance. Like you mm-hmm. could see Afro beats and then there's like Calypso. So you see all these different dance moves mm-hmm. from the different parts of the diaspora, but you see the rootedness with West African sort of dances. So that's mm-hmm. that's sort of what we do. It's really exciting and currently doing some research. It's really fun and exciting hearing how the Afrocentric SEL framework. Like I taught one of my teaching artists, Deshaun, who does fashion graffiti and also does AP computer science. Mm-hmm. You know, he was telling me how by learning the Afrocentric SEL framework, he was able to communicate with his students who weren't actually black but were Korean, but use like culturally responsive tools for him to use graffiti for them to, you know. Why don't you use like write in your native tongue, like and, and do a tag, like writing your own name? Yeah. So it was just it's a really cool experience. Mm-hmm. Afrocentric SEL too. I think it's really important to know. I feel like I'm going on about it, but no, that's great. It is centering, you know, Africa, but it's not, you know, it we, we think about Eurocentric learning and Afrocentric learning. I don't want to think of Afrocentric centricity as something that we're just not talking about Eurocentric learning. Afrocentric learning really, really comes from, you know, what's the oldest civilization in the world is in Africa. Africa is so diverse, right? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, if we start with Eurocentric learning, we're missing out on so much history that came before that. So Mm -hmm. I think it's important just to note that because I I know there may be some folks that may feel that it's like, okay, we're only really talking about this one group and these one group of people. 
when I think Afrocentric SEL offers itself to culturally responsive learning. And I come from a Montessori background, so constructivist model definitely plays a role in that. Understand your mm-hmm. core identity, your self identity, your you know your black identity, your ethnic and racial identity. There's a lot of layers. And also there's a chart that if anyone wants to see, it's on my website that talks more in depth about that. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I feel like it, you know, what you're talking about, I loved the example with dance of like finding these roots. And I feel like that's what you're getting at now too with like that Afrocentric learning is the root. Like that's, we all came from this, you know, little spot and then came out from there and so many changes happened, right? But I love that idea of looking at the dance, all these different dances that have emerged and seeing the differences, but then seeing like the common root that's embedded in in them. I feel like that's a really sort of visual and just beautiful way to kind of look at it and see the interconnectedness, but also the amazing differences that have have happened over time and that continue to happen. Yeah, and it's really, it says on our profile, which I'm very thankful for my program associate for putting it into great words, which is really looking at the human experience through the Pan-African and African diasporic um, culture and history and art. It's, it really is Mm -hmm. that Um, that's really what we're doing. And it's, Right now, there is a hyper focus on the Pan African diaspora in Africa. But my goal is to, you know, what would it look like if we did cultural exchange between artists in, you know, Puerto Rico and uh, Japan and do like a hip hop thing? Like it, it's a global experience, and it, it's mm-hmm. really important to have those opportunities, as I said before, and, and an infrastructure that allows for those experience to happen hopefully that schools will be receptive to of this thinking but time will tell mm-hmm. but nonetheless i'm not reliant on schools and again very fortunate mm-hmm. for the communities that i'm a part of beautiful i was very lucky the last i guess like a week ago to be able to attend the california art education association conference and got to like you were talking about finally meeting people in person that you've been in touch with for so long. So I got to hear Alicia Mernick talking about decentering whiteness. And one of the sort of slides and like discussion points that really stood out to me, again, I'm such a visual person, <laughs> <laughs> the way she talked about it as like when we say decentering whiteness, that doesn't mean that we're like, there's a circle right now around whiteness in education. And everything is built around this European, you know, center. When we say decentering, it doesn't mean let's move it over to somewhere else. Let's move it to like, you know, what you're doing right now, it does feel like you're moving it there, which is totally necessary. Like you're centering, your your work is Afrocentric. And what she was talking about is that when we say decentering that, the goal is that we blow that circle up, like that circle is gone. There's no longer a circle that we're able to look at all these different things that are happening in the world and all these different identities that we have, that our students have, and that our systems, our bigger like structure of education doesn't center on any one of those things <laughs> that it embraces and allows for all of those things. Yeah, that's such a good point. And I, mm-hmm. when I first got into doing this work, I like that was sort of my goal. But to be honest, like it's, I feel like we're so, I think we we have a lot of learning to do before even thinking about just like we understand everyone's culture, <laughs> like you know, and that's right, and that's, right. You know, really, unfor- I I hate that I have to say that because I like to think that I'm like. I don't I hate this word, but like quote, but I, I, you know, working in Puerto Rico, I thought, you know, we're both black. There's like a, a black community. And I was like, okay, like we, we understand our experiences. I get discriminated against, you get discriminated against. 
No, it's not like that. Like, mm. their experience, I still have trouble understanding the Black experience in Puerto Rico. And I'm Black. Imagine how people who are mm-hmm. white in America are dealing with understanding black. And I also, it's another thing too, like a lot mm. of people who I thought understood my experience and because we're having more conversations about race, don't really get my experience. And some of it is really offensive. And I think there's going to be a lot of time mm. and, you know, Afrocentric, yeah, we're centering around Afrocentric learning the hope but that's so needed, needed but I right? hope that using culturally responsive learning and, and having students who may not be white also say hey like I get that I see that in black culture I, mean, I could see it in, in my own culture too so being inclusive in that so so even though we're centering around black blackness right now the goal is also to move into okay like how can we allow for everyone to see themselves through a certain framework and i think art is that way to do that and and art Mm. is a way for us to understand ourselves and uh, our students like instead of having your student write down how they feel you know they might want to draw how they feel or might act out how they feel Mm -hmm. or you know say in their native tongue you know there's so many different ways so Mm. I don't know. I hope I hope it resonates with somebody. Absolutely. Yeah. And I I brought up that idea that Alicia was sharing because it it felt like connected to this. And not to say that I feel like both ideas need to exist and can coexist somehow. Like they're not completely opposed. You know, we're living in, we've been living in for I for as long as we know. Um, as long as these education structures and systems have existed, they've been white centered. Yeah. So having having a little bit of like not that <laughs> before we're able to move towards like there is no center, like that that makes sense to me. Me too. I hope. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hope that other people <laughs> resonate with that as well, especially arts yeah. education. I feel like you know. Another thing too, when I when I talk to arts educators, I feel like they're just like right in the front lines. They totally get it. We have these conversations. And then when I don't talk to folks in the arts education space, it's just like, okay, we have to I have to step back a little bit. I have to like tone down my mm. language. Uh, it's such a real I don't know if you've had an experience, but I for sure have had mm. that. Yeah. With others in education, but not in yep. the arts. Yeah. And, yeah. and also in general, too, mm-hmm. again, the arts education world mm-hmm. is um, its own little bubble that I love to live in. But not everyone is like that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that connects back to what you were saying about the arts as a way for students to express themselves and for, you know, for us to sort of understand these ideas that are so big. And they're like things that are happening on very micro levels and on very macro levels and like everything in between. And I feel like for me, visuals are the way to understand it. And, you know, I can't really articulate it (laughs) for someone else. It might be like this movement helps them kind of understand these big things that are happening and, you know, it's, yeah, it's through the art. Yes. Hopefully I'm trying to, maybe you could help me out, like have more of my content be more interactive, which I, I mean, I, I feel like I'm, mm. I'm doing a pretty decent job, but if you know any folks who want to help with that, please pass them along to me. Yeah. And if anybody listening is interested, get in touch please, with Melissa. Please. It's info at blackteachingartistslab.com. I always check my emails. Awesome. Yeah, you're probably way better than me about I that. I live on <laughs> Gmail. It is my best friend. Oh, yeah. And that actually brings me to questions I like to ask people that are not totally related to, you know, what we've been talking about, but just kind of getting a picture, like getting a peek into your life. How are you? I know you've talked about like losing work and then really focusing on this project and on Black Teaching Artists Lab, which is huge now. But I'm curious how you kind of fit it all in, like what's going on? What does a day in the life or a week in the life kind of look like? I'm so (laughs) 
lame. I'm like honestly <laughs> the most boring person ever. I just got a puppy. <laughs> I got a puppy for my mom. Oh, she's a schnoodle, and she her name is Gigi. She was named after her great uncle, who is George, who looks just like so her. Cute. The, the, the dog is it's her uncle is a dog so it's not actually a person <laughs> so just just to let people know but she was named after him she's you know honestly i still live with my parents and they're like my life so i because i know mm-hmm. like when in when i get a little bit older maybe in three years i want to move to ohio very random but mm. that's what i want to do but you know, I, I really just want to spend time with my family. I love spending time with my mom. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know you, you don't always have your parents forever. And I, just, I don't know. They're, that's my life. My life is my mom and my dog and mm-hmm. uh, a lot of Netflix, oh. a lot of reality TV shows. I, I can't, you know, <laughs> I cannot get into like Game of Thrones or I don't know. What's a, another, those British shows. It's too much. Like I do too much oh, work yeah. that when I, when I get home... I want to watch The Real Housewives of New York. Like, that's really just what I want to do mm-hmm. and snuggle up with my dog <laughs> and eat Thai food. That is that mm-hmm. is the day to life. And get coffee, too. Coffee is uh, very mm-hmm. important. I don't know. Have you ever had a Cortado? Yes. A long time ago. How you get back yeah. on that train. Mm-hmm. Cortados mm-hmm. are life with a shot of vanilla. And I don't know if you drink milk, but a little bit of half and mm-hmm. half. It's the perfect mm. drink. That's what I had this morning. Do you have like a favorite local place that does so it? So I, d- <laughs> I live in Prospect Lefford Gardens, which is if pe- people oh, yeah. know, I live in Brooklyn. It's very communal. Everyone kind of knows each other and there's a lot of local businesses. So I do mm-hmm. have one, which is Cinnamon Girl, but there's only one person who makes my drink. That she has to make my drink. So, but I also, <laughs> my mom likes a hot chocolate there. So I went today, I went to a different coffee shop, got my Cortado, and I came back to Cinnamon Girl. And the guy was like, you can't come into our cafe with somebody else's drink. Like, you can't do that. <laughs> but I got my hot chocolate anyway. So there's multiple, there's great places. There's Brooklyn Perk named after central park Mm -hmm. from friends yeah which is also black (laughs) one too so check it out if you're in brooklyn and also ish cafe which is a mayan and guatemalan restaurant my favorite place Mm. they know me by name and order they are my family and those are three of my favorite spots in prospect lefford gardens and it's three blocks away from my house and it's also a block away from i live a block away from the train too so um very spoiled that's it is awesome honestly the best and yes. also the best trains the q and oh. the b please if anyone's from new york do not mm-hmm. argue with me the q and the b is the best trains <laughs> in new york city so oh. very very fortunate yeah i spent too many years really close to a c oh no stop in brooklyn i was like that's it's useless. Oh no, <laughs> the C trains are the oldest trains, oh. and it's like mm-hmm. all it's right, and you can like hear the A's going by, but not stop. Yeah, the Express. <laughs> oh, why? Yes, I I feel bad for anyone who was near to C, oh. E, and A trains. All New Yorkers right now are relating. <laughs> Other people are like, "What's going? Yeah. Like, why are you talking about the alphabet?" <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> oh. Yeah. Oh, those trains. Yeah, I relied on a bus for a while. Oh, man. Oh. And there were definitely days when I was like, I'm just gonna walk. Were you like, in Brooklyn? There's no point. Yeah, I was for a while I lived in Fort Greene and then I was working in Bed Stuy. So like the walk wasn't that it's not bad. bad. I went to school. I went to college in but, at St. Joseph's College, which is in Fort Greene. Oh yeah. Right there. Yeah, really close. Super close. Ah. I Beautiful love it. place. <laughs> Connections. Yeah. And then I lived in Crown Heights for a little while. We're, we were neighbors. <laughs> so Yeah, we, we were neighbors. I love it. <laughs> yeah. And now I'm in sunny California. Jealous. It's getting so cold in New York. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's like no, 80 stop. Today. You can't say that. <laughs> it's insane. You can't say that when it's <laughs> raining and 40 degrees oh, here. I know. It's for us, though, we're like, what happened? There was actual fall weather for a brief moment. Yeah. And now degrees. it's like full on summer again. <laughs> <Lucky. Yep. laughs> oh, yeah. 
I miss seasons sometimes, though. <laughs> it's, you know, when you think about seasons and then you think about New York and when it snows and then there's the ice and the falling yeah. and, you know, you 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 yeah. be thankful that it's yeah. sunny. You're like, nope. <laughs> it's also, I, I feel like it's weird in yeah. February when it's hot. I never experienced that before. Mm. But I will because I'll be going to Florida. <laughs> so Oh, yeah. Be... You'll get a little Florida vacation. Yes, yeah, I I don't know if i'm i'm excited but i i've never been to florida before so hope i can convince one of my friends to come with me yeah power in yes. numbers <laughs> uh well i have a few sort of like fun more get to know you questions so one that i always like to ask is what are you curious about right now i you know what it's so random i went through this rabbit hole I'm interested in India. Like, I'm really interested Mm. in learning about the 18th and 19th centuries socioeconomic policies in India. That Mm. sounds, that sounds awfully specific, but I just, you know, there's, I just don't know a lot about the history there. There's so much history. Mm. Yeah. You know, when you go on, like when you can't sleep and then you ended up, going through a rabbit hole of stuff that's what happened to me the other night and i just was like really interested in that in 18th century india and i was like you know i didn't get a book mm. on it or like a like a small encyclopedia yeah. but that's what i'm curious about if you know mm. any good books let me know hmm. i do not know on that topic i feel like that could be really interesting though as a way to like understand what's happening now mm-hmm. too, the history major. All right, yeah. <laughs> hey, <laughs> you're like curious about <laughs> the world. Mm-hmm. I love that. And then I wonder how that will, like, if that will work its way into the work you're doing too with Black Teaching Artists. Well, Lab. funny enough, like my 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 family's from the Caribbean, and on my mom's side, we traced our heritage back to India because of like the indentured servants. Ooh. So there is definitely history there, not related to why I'm currently interested in it. But you know, that's that's yeah. a lot of Caribbean folks. They have their heritage in India. Huh. It may. I don't know. It'd be cool yeah. to kind of see how that actually plays out. With my curiosity, yeah. knowing me, it probably will. It'll all come back around and connect. Yes, be kind of uh, cool. Amazing. Okay, fun, kind of silly question. What is your favorite food? It has to be Thai food. I love Thai food. Mm. I love pasayu noodles. And I don't know, I just like the tum yum soup. I'm saying that so wrong, but mm. it's so good. <laughs> I love Thai food. I've been really into Greek food. I had Greek food yesterday, and it's just there's like the spinach and rice, and it's vegan. I'm I'm like mm-hmm. I mean I don't, I mean, eat I eat meat, but like it's if for folks who are vegan, it's really yummy. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm like really international today. I'm like India, Greek, Thai food, <laughs> all, <laughs> all of it. Of it. <laughs> Uh, I love it. Uh, Thank you so much, Melissa. I always like to also give space for, is there anything that we missed? Is there anything you really wanted to get a chance to talk about or share that we didn't touch on? I think we talked about, and we obviously, our our fundraisers happening and our surveys Mm -hmm. happening. And I think, you know, so please, anyone who is an art administrator, support your teaching artists especially those Mm -hmm. who come from marginalized backgrounds as we know like teaching artists may not have health insurance may not you know just Mm -hmm. seasonal or contracted workers yet they hold such an important place in the classroom so if anyone who is an art Mm -hmm. administrator or, or hires teaching artists please appreciate and respect all of them because they are so important mm-hmm. and crucial to our students' understanding of self. And that's my PSA Absolutely. for today. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And I would add even more of a push there to like, if you're an administrator and you hire teaching artists and you don't give them benefits change that now like they deserve benefits they deserve a living wage 
<laughs> they deserve contracts so that when the school randomly says, oh, we don't need art right now, you don't fire your teaching artists. You say, well, we had a contract. Yeah, stand up for your rights, teaching artists. Yeah. We have your back. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> and then I want to also give you a chance to give a shout out if there's anybody you want to thank that's really helped you along the way. I yeah. want to shout out Abby Ferris, who is my program associate. She's amazing. She is starting her own 501c3 called Learn to Link. And that should be launching, Ooh. as I think, when it's launched in January. So go and please support her. It's learntolink.com. Really amazing grant writer, supporter. I can't tell you how many times I've cried to her. And she's just been so amazing. She sends the oh. most amazing thoughtful cards and i don't know she's she's black teaching artist i would never be as good as it is if it wasn't for abby mm. yeah i just i love you <laughs> she's, she's amazing oh, so sweet i love that yeah and i'll link to her thank as thank well. you that would be awesome yes. yes and then last thing i know you've shared already but just one more time could you share where people can connect with you online Please follow me on Instagram yes. at Black Teaching Artist Lab. All of the posts is curated mainly by me, and it's me. <laughs> and also, my email is info at blackteachingartistlab.com. So those are where you can find me. Awesome. I tried Twitter, but it's not working out for me. Yeah. It's not. No one's following me there. <laughs> so Yeah, I I like made accounts in all of them. And then I was like, I don't have time for this. And I feel like it is so easy when, you know, when there's much bigger organizations out there that have like full-time jobs or many, several jobs that are all focused around social media, it's easy to forget that a lot of times it's just like one person who's, you know, the one behind all of it. Like we're doing all the work but we're also doing all the social media stuff. <laughs> well, your your Instagram is amazing. Like I, oh, I think it's, is it you. just you? It's just me. I've, yeah, I've slowed down a little bit the last week or two where I'm just like, I'm too busy. <laughs> it looks great. I give you so many props. Thank you. Same right back at you. Yes. <laughs> Thank it's, you. Yeah. Like I would not know. And that's the thing. Like you don't know who's behind it, what's going on behind the scenes. So it's really cool to hear some more of that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I pride myself on it and yes. my website too. It looks so. amazing. Looks so good. So thank everybody you. go check it out. And yeah. yes, thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you. This is, this is great. Thank you so much for listening. As always, you can reach me at Teaching Artist Podcast on Instagram or Teaching Artist Podcast at gmail.com. Who do you want to hear from? Please share your recommendations of teaching artists. And if you loved this episode, please subscribe, leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts, and follow me. It really makes a big difference. Thank you. Thank you.